Yesterday we started off with trying to understand some of the terms that commonly appeared in the last two units that we have studied so far, structuralism, post-structuralism and deconstruction. And continuing with our study, we saw some of the few famous theorists and we saw how language made uh, language, is, language is seen as signs, a system of signs and how each sign could be uh, understood as signifier and signified and, and at various levels how signs could be interpreted in different ways. And uh, this sign could be anywhere from a word to a gesture to a, a, or just about anything that contributed to successful communication, okay, successful and understandable form of communication. And yes, we saw how there was connotation and denotation. Then denotation would be literal meaning, whereas the connotation would be meaning that is uh, culturally or um, uh, or uh, individually constructed. Of yeah, and we also saw the the, the differences in icons, symbols, and indexes, and also syntam and paradigm. We saw how sign systems were m mostly arbitrary, mainly arbitrary and therefore used by convention rather than any logic or reason behind it. And we also saw language as, as a lang, as in the, a system of signs of, uh, used by a certain community of people and how those people are aware of all of its functionalities, all of its uh, the structures within it so that they could successfully use it to uh, you know, make a, a reasonable or understandable conversation and conversation or discourse. And how parole was the individual performance of of each person of each of each individual um, within that lang, and we we understood language as a system of differences. How signs find value only when they are recognizably different okay, from each other, and we saw a little bit about how semiotics helps in everyday relations and or roughly divided how we could see semiotics in three branches semantics syntactics and pragmatics semantics while it dealt with while it dealt with the sign and the things to which they refer the denotata as in the meaning making whereas the syntactics or dealt or would be something that helps you understand the relationship between signs um you know within within a frame within formal structures and pragmatics would be how this or how signs uh, or, or, or set of signs affect the one who is using them and the one upon whom it is being used. Yeah, and uh, to understand it better, I'll just a uh, uh, flow chart to indicate what uh, what semantics is, what is a gesture. Semantics would be what what it is referred to, what is being talked about. Whereas syntactics would be what other gestures are used, as in the set of signs that are included along with the one one gesture one sign and what does it mean what does it mean to the one who's using it and what does it mean to the one who's receiving it and uh, just a diagram to indicate a uh, similarity in relation between signs and object data uh, indicating that signifier and signified as two sides of a of a coin how signifier and signified are inseparable. Signifier would include anything from word, sound, image, anything. And signified would be the concept, the identity. So the concept is encoded in the, you know, in, within the signifier. Uh, we saw an example of how a dog, the concept of an animal with four legs and a tail and that barks would be the signified, the concept of a dog. And how the dog is referred to, that is this DOG dog signifier. And as in like the signifier would be the symbol, the written image or the sound image, right? The word image. Now sign would be a, a cumulative of both. A sign would not exist without either of these. So signifier code as in DOG dog and the concept, the concept that would include Four legs, tail, box, not cat, not wolf, not bog or god. Again, using the the, the denotative level, at a denotative level, what we see is cat, C A T cat, would would be the word or the um you know the the sign cat would have both signifier code and signified concept. The code here would be C A T, and the concept would be four legs, tail, uh, with with tail and meows that. 
uh, that is not a dog, that is not a tiger, that is not a bat. And we also realize that it is arbitrary. The signifier and signified come together not by any reason or logic. That they are purely arbitrary. They are randomly done. Okay. There is no necessary relationship between dog, dog, and this animal, right? Signified and signifier fire are inseparable language means negatively. That is in terms of what it is not. So we'll be talking about what it is not in the sense what is not present, what is absent. So signs acquire meaning through difference. So you understand a dog is a dog because it is different from cat, all right? A DOG dog is different from a CAT cat because they are different codes and refer to different concepts. While meaning is an agreement between a community of language speakers. So you understand that oh, to form a meaning, to give meaning to any word, it has to be, you know, uh, it has to be equally accepted by or equally, equally agreed by everyone in the community or at least some people in the community for you to uh, make use of that sign so unless and until uh, you know you have a set of people who are um, familiar with the signs that you are using whether it be verbal sign or written written sign or or a written image or a picture there is no point in using that sign because no one is going to understand it anyway so no meaning could be established so meaning is established only when it is uh, accepted uh, or deciphered or decoded by the receiver so texts are complex networks of signs so what you find is text every text is a complex network of signs so, it, so each sign interacts with another sign it's as if like you know uh, as if these are free electrons all uh, all at a random state or, or all at uh, um, energized level and each one seems to have each sign seems to have a life of its own interacting with the other sign so at the connotative level we see denotation would be a, a dog an actual animal and a literal sense of what the dog is at the connotative level what you find is a dog would indicate that you are that it is protective it is faithful it is trusting it is aggressive it is helpful it is brave it is masculine all of these connotative meanings in uh, you understand them in relation to dog right so the codes and concepts for uh, we realize that codes and concepts they they enter all you know all, all sorts of things we do everything everything we do and we also saw two theorists um, Charles Sanders Fairs and Northrop Fry, uh, how they seem to have analyzed uh, the sign systems. Now we wouldn't go into the details of it. It's, uh, it's going to take very long if we go into it. So this is where I believe we stopped yesterday. The metaphysics of presence, or rather we could say the presence and absence. See, Derrida was quite concerned about the idea of presence and absence. In fact, even before him, Heidegger and many other uh, theorists, they have been talking about presence for a long time, even Aristotle for that matter. Speech is privileged over writing mainly because speech has a certain immediacy to it that the person who is speaking is right in front. Okay, so there is a sense of immediacy in the meaning making, whereas the written word has the absence, you know, that is there is no person behind it immediately and I, I mean the written word is read in the absence of the one who has written it right so that's the reason because of the presence the speech is privileged over writing so once again what we see is in another sense in another sense for instance we understand a certain word because of the absence of a certain idea within it right we understand a certain signifier because it it does not have certain things okay there is an absence of things see a dog is a dog because it is not a cat there is an absence of cat like things a dog is a dog but because it does not meow there is the absence of meow right the, that is the the absence of meow is present there that's why we realize it we understand it that even though it's a domestic animal even though it has four legs even though it has a tail even though it is it is very close to humans even though 
even though it can be treated as a pet it, we understand that it is a dog because it is not meow so this absence the sorry this presence of the absence you know the absence here is the absence of meow now this absence is present there in the concept in the concept of a dog that's the main reason one of the main reasons why we understand a dog is a dog or for instance say day we understand it's a day because it is not night <laughs> right we understand it is day why do we understand how do we realize how do we how can we be sure that it is a day because it is not dark yet it, it does not have the all the uh, uh, all the uh, you know signification that comes with uh, with the idea of night a night is supposed to be dark a night is most of the time quiet right so it since the day is not dark you could say that yes there is the presence of the absence what is absent here darkness is absent so when the darkness is absent you realize that it is day so every positive word or i cannot even call it a word positive word every positive sign ha carries with it some negative inside it negative element inside it see as we spoke of uh, like uh, while so sure talked about binary oppositions okay he spoke about paradigmatic chain as well but consider the binary oppositions you know everything is understood as an opposite right most things are understood as as opposites so this binary opposition you see for instance man a man carries with it the the, the idea of man the concept okay the the signifier carries within it the concept of all the masculinity all the all the maleness within it also it carries within it the absence of femininity right i hope it is very clear to you uh, by now because i've given so many examples so see a man is a man because he is not a woman a woman is a woman because she is not a man i mean uh, you know not not only in physical terms i'm not only merely merely talking about um uh, you know the physical appearance of a man or a woman all the things all the uh, concepts that ideas that go along with the with the making of man or a woman their absence is felt in the opposite word all right and because of the presence of those absence we get a complete sense of each word all right so uh, well i'll come to the slide here the assumption that physical presence of a speaker authenticates speech and this is at one level okay the assumption that physical presence of a speaker authenticates speech so when there when the speech is there when someone is speaking there is a physical presence of the speaker so the, the you know the, there is an actual person to authenticate the speech speaking would then precede writing as in like that's how they came to believe or came to agree among each other that speech is better than writing speech came first writing came next since the writer is not at present at the reading of his text to authenticate see that's how the concept of phonocentrism came into being so the metaphysics of presence broadly encompasses those those ideas such as logocentrism phonocentrism binary opposition and other notions that western thought posits in its conceptions of language and total metaphysics so it is not purely one idea as in uh, the privileging of speech over writing it is not merely the idea of the absence of presence in uh, in the understanding of a binary opposition it, it's it's not one single thing that you are concerned with when we are talking about metaphysics it's a multiple multiple ideas different ideas um, you know different ways in which each philosopher seems to have discussed upon the metaphysics of presence no entity is a fixed presence but it is marked with the traces of past and future so we'll talk about trace as well so man carries a trace of of, of woman within him a woman carries a trace of man how this trace exists in the form of a presence of absence right i am i, I am a, a, a woman right 
I am a woman, I am a daughter. Say I am a daughter. I carry within me certain aspects of that which is I am not. Like I am not a son. Right? Uh, there should be certain ideas associated with the, with the concept of son. S-O-N, son. I do not carry those concepts. That's why I am daughter. So there is a trace of what is opposite to me within in, within me. So I am incomplete all by myself. So I am understood in relation to everything around me. That which is adjacent to me, that which is parallel to me, that which is opposite to me, that which is, uh, you know, that which has gone before me, that which will come after me. You see, I am made possible only because of everything that I am related to. Whether in, you know, immediate future or in different, uh, or in a distant, uh, uh, I mean, not merely future, you know, distance and space and time. So binary opposition generally goes for, uh, we've already discussed binary opposition. So it, uh, it seems to privilege one over the other, high over low, right over wrong, right over left, male over female, inside over outside. So there is always a certain opposition occurring inadvertently and consciously. I'm not saying that we are doing it consciously. See, if there are Christians and Jews in a, in a Jewish minority, the Christians are, you know, privileged. So they seem to be standing at the opposite sides, not together. So, and vice versa, vice versa, of course. Now, speaking of trace, we've, uh, we've been talking about trace. See, binary positions is something that we have uh, discussed quite often. But trace is something I believe uh, you need to know. See, we, we understood that we have, we carry within us or every sign carries within itself traces. Traces of the opposite of that which has already gone or that which will come later or anything even remotely related to it. The trace is not a presence but is rather the simulacrum of a presence that dislocates, displaces and refers beyond itself. So what does trace do? It's, uh, Derry goes further to say that it is not merely a presence. It is a simulacrum, as in something, simulation of a presence, as in the present, even uh, the present would indicate an actual presence. A simulation of presence would indicate that it is imagined to be present, but it is not there. It's like a wispy smoke. A smoke, can, can you see smoke? Yes, you can see smoke. Can you feel it? Uh, yes, if it is very, very strong, you can. But it it is not actually present, right? It just seems to evaporate within seconds. And you, you are left wondering if it was actually there or not. Like fog, right? So it is, uh, it is, so it is a simulation. It's something that exists in the subconscious of a text, of, of, a, of a sign, okay? So it is a simulacrum of a presence that dislocates, displaces, and refers beyond itself. It, it totally dislocates and displaces and goes beyond itself. The trace has, properly speaking, no place for effacement belongs to the very structure of the trace. So the trace has no place in it. So you cannot say that a man carries the trace of a woman because the trace is not actually present. It is just simulated. It's a simulacrum of the idea of trace. See, for instance, consider a pig. Okay, A pig is supposed to be big. It is supposed to be pink. And it is dirty and smelly and is used for eating in some community some, by some people. And yeah, basically it stinks. But there are other things, but it carries within itself so many other traces, right? So the trace is neither present nor absent. These concepts are neither present or abs nor absent. They always seem to be, you know lurking, lurking behind the subconscious. So what we are left with is a network of signifiers. So each signification, see, uh, one meaning, to understand a pig, if I take up a dictionary, if I try to understand a pig, what I come up with was, well, a minute, please, is this, a pig. Pig is an omnivorous, domesticated, hoofed mammal with sparse, bristly hair and a flat snout for rooting in the soil kept for its meat okay so 
I, to understand pig, have taken up a dictionary. And the dictionary tells me that it is an omnivorous, domesticated, hoofed mammal with sparse, bristly hair and a flat snout for rooting in the soil kept for its meat. Now, to understand one sign, I have referred or, or, or tried to decipher the meaning. I have, I am now encountered with some 10 more signs. Omnivorous, domesticated, hoofed, mammal, sparse, bristly, hair, flat, snout, rooting. Okay, that goes beyond 10. So to understand what omnivorous is, I look up omnivorous in the dictionary. So what does omnivorous mean? It says of an animal or person feeding on a variety of food of both plant and animal origin. Okay, so to understand this one sign, omnivorous, I looked up in the dictionary and what I found was another some 10 set of signs. So further to understand each sign, each one of these signs, if I look them up, I will once again be bombarded with further more signs. So each sign seems to, you know, or seems to be incomplete or point out to another signifier. And these signifier seems to be connected to furthermore signifiers. So at the end, what I do is I go on and on and on. I think, I think uh, it would be endless. I wouldn't know where to stop if I kept going, right? So for what we do is generally, when we take up a sign and we try to understand its meaning, we we are encountered with some, some five or 10 more signs. So we try to understand one or two of those signs and some are already by syntax or by, by, our, by the convention, um, we, we automatically understand what it would mean. At least we get a sense of understanding. We feel that we have understood. Uh, we have not necessarily understood everything, right? Generally, when we come across any, any kind of communication, any kind of, whether it be you know, in your something in your own mother tongue, whether it be Tamil or Urdu or or something from English, what we get is an inkling of understanding. We we do not completely understand, and we are satisfied with it. We we don't complain. We don't complain. We are satisfied with whatever understanding we have arrived at. Right. So the trace. So. What we are left with is a network of signifi signifiers. So one, one signifier was, is never enough for us. To understand that sign, we are dependent upon plenty of other signifiers. And each signifier of those would once again be dependent on other signifiers to give it, give it any proper meaning. And once again, it would see we are left with its end the signifiers. So what happens is we are left with a, with a constant state of deference, Deferen, deferral as in, uh, as in how something is postponed, the postpone, postponement of meaning, right? The, the meaning is always postponed. There is, there is never a, a completion to the meaning, right? So I take up a sign, I try to understand it, but then I'm further directed to further signifiers and then again, further signifiers, again, further signifiers, the meaning is never complete. The meaning is never made complete. Right? There is always a deferral, as in for later, postponed to some other time. So that's how, um, yeah, that's how Derrida arrived at deference. So even though it is written with a, an A, deference, it is pronounced as difference, of course. So now differ difference is nothing but, uh, it's, it's a, portmanteau word they call it a portmanteau word why because it carries two meanings inside it's been made of two two words two different words so one word would be different d-i-f-f-e-r-e-n-t now another word would be defer differ and defer see writing in difference portmanteau word difference would be to differ binary opposition and to defer postponement of meaning and put under erasure. So under erasure, I believe you've come across this as well at some point. 
So what we are left with is difference, di, fft, i, e, that is that comes from differ and differ. So the meaning is never complete. It is either it first of all it has to be different. Every meaning is made because it is different from every sign is different from other signs. So that's why we understand. That's how we understand a sign, recognize a sign. Whereas it also the meaning is also never complete. It is there is always a deferral, deferral going on, postponement of meaning, and hence it is put under eraser. Under eraser as in something that is always erased. Before it comes into existence, it has to be erased. So the meaning is never complete. You may believe that you have arrived at certain meaning, but then what you find is another sign contradicting it. Right? So what you do is that particular sign, you know, the, the meaning of which you have had some understanding, that sign is put under Raja. So they don't mean but differ, impasse, aporia, trace. Okay, so impasse as in you and you never arrive at a at a proper stance, you could call it. You never arrive at, uh, you know, it is always an ongoing puzzle. We spoke of aporia, remember? In one of my lectures, I spoke of aporia. So it's, it's an impasse, as in a puzzle. It never seems to untangle, okay, disentangle. Aporia, again, impasse, aporia, they're all both same. And they are they always carry traces within themselves. Now, archiriding is a form of language which cannot be conceptualized within the metaphysics of presence and is not derived from speech. You know how the trace seems to function in the absence of any author or reader? Like, you know, the, the trace gives you a complete idea of a whole, right? So, archiriding seems to tell you, at least, uh, Derrida indulges of... Uh, uh, in in this in this idea, indicating that uh, the fact that a signifier, okay, the signifier can mean any one particular thing, depends on there being at the same time other signifiers that mean other things and which are absent, but constantly effective in the system. This constant trace of the absent signifier in the presence of any other signifier is the difference. That creates meaning so um, well since uh, I, I believe you have some understanding so what happens is you at this uh, you know in this way what you tend to do is you tend to privilege writing over speech rather than speech over writing okay because what you what you understand from arch writing is that it is already there the language is already there the sign systems is already there so if you are going to wonder about how a certain trace determines the authenticity of a, of a sign, you would be relying on writing, not speech. Because speech is temporal. Okay, Temporal as in it is very temporary, right? I utter it and it is lost. It, it does not. Once it is out of my mouth, once you have heard it, it's gone. It's not there. Whereas writing... All, when you write, all the signs, all the signs are simultaneously there in the text. Okay. So, what happens is the trace within each sign is present all together at the same time, which is not the case with speech. So, he argued against the privileging of speech over writing. He did not uh, like really enforce the idea that writing should be privileged over speech. In fact, he was against all privileges. Okay. He was against all privileging. So he did not want to, um, you know, reverse the role. Rather, he just wanted to break down the privileging system, you know, uh, th that was practiced, that had been practiced for centuries. So Rousseau teaches that writing may become a dangerous supplement if it is used as a substitute for speech. Generally, what we do is writing is something, why do you write? You write either to convey some communication, you pass on some communication to someone, or you write because... Uh, well, in my case, I write because I tend to forget a lot. Okay. So, you, you may forget. So, you keep it down. Make a note of it. And, you know, for memory, for later memory. Whenever you make a transaction, you write. Right. So, that, uh, you know, both parties may not forget. And it has been written down. Once it has been written down, it is concrete. Right. No one is going to uh, argue against it. No one is going to um, prove you false. So, it, it is used as an evidence, a kind of proof. So, if... Rosa says, 
teaches that writing may become a dangerous supplement if it is used as a substitute for speech. As he states, languages are made to be spoken. Writing serves only as a supplement to speech. See, there, there is like a, a privileging of speech going on here. But then you also need to remember that language is whole in itself. I mean, the speech is whole in itself and the writing is whole in itself. Whole as in W-H-O-L-E. Derrida counter argues that though writing may be stated as, a, stated as a mere supplement to speech, that necessarily means that writing still adds meaning to speech and it may still provide a kind of presence. See, you, Derrida argues that though writing may be stated as a mere supplement, see, it, it, it is not considered as a whole by, uh, by, by the writers, uh, by the theorists uh, before Derrida. They believe that only speech, speech was complete, speech was whole, right? So writing is treated as a supplement, something that supplements speech, right? So if or if it's if writing is considered as a mere supplement to speech, that would necessarily mean that writing still add meaning to speech, right? So in since it is supplementing, when when do you supplement something? When it requires more power, right? When when it requires more nourishment, when it is lacking somehow. Not lacking, but yes, you you supplement something even if it's whole, complete. And it may still prove a kind of presence. Also, writing being viewed as a supplement to speech suggests that there is a loss of presence in speech. Which must be supplemented by writing. See, it's a, it's a paradox. He has completely reverted the idea of, you know, immediacy in speech. Speech is privileged mainly because... There is an immediate presence of the speaker to authenticate whatever has been spoken. Agreed? You all agree with me? And if writing is to be supplementing speech, what it means is that the speech is somehow lacking. There is a loss of presence in speech. So that's why it is being supplemented by writing. So Derrida observes that while Rousseau condemns and disqualifies writing in his experience as a writer, he valorizes and rehabilitates in writing. See, Rousseau is against writing, right? He seems to privilege speech. He seems to say that speech is what is all important. Speech is the, 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 the supreme form of communication, right? The original form of communication. But then, and, and he condemns and condemns. Who is condemning? Rousseau. Rousseau condemns, uh, condemns and disqualifies writing. In his experience as a writer, experience as a writer, as in Rousseau himself became famous. We are reading Rousseau mainly because he wrote, not spoke. If he had only spoken, all of his ideas would have been lost. See, he, he himself is, uh, you know, he himself dug a con uh, this pit for himself. You know, he valorizes and rehabilitates writing. Writing became, becomes a mean to recover whatever presence is lacking. See, writing has become something, right? So writing is whole. So only if it is complete, only, only when it is nourished, it can supplement, supplement something else, right? So imagine the circle is uh, speech. Actually, I got it from, again, from the internet and I'm using it for my own purpose. Forgive me. But yes, it seemed, uh, well, fit to fit for my use. Anyway, consider this as speech. Now, it may be complete in its own sense, but then if it is, you know, if it requires, if it requires supplement from something else, from writing, then it means there is lacking, there is something lacking here. And if writing is going to supplement something else, when do, when is something able to supplement someone, something else? I will want to help you only when I am fit and fine, right? When I'm complete and whole, I will be able to help you. So I would have to be complete first. I would have to be fit first. So in, in this regard, in this sense, you I believe Derrida argues that writing itself is complete to be able to supplement the speech. So writing or speech, Derrida extended its scope and pointed out language is not a direct experience of reality, but rather a socially constructed approximation. So we understood, we've already understood that language is not a direct experience of reality, but rather a socially constructed approximation. It's merely constructed. An approximation, it is not even uh, perfect. 
just an approximation of reality so what we are getting is when we are using language we are constructing and reconstructing and are being constructed every day hence no word is ever entirely adequate to explain reality and thus all languages under erasure so there there is not a single see we use words to relate to communicate but how far that communication is perfect is only god knows because no language is complete or adequate i may feel something but my feeling cannot be expressed wholly and completely with the kind of vocabulary i have and even if even if i were oh, see there were so many writers who commit, uh, uh remember um all those writers who who had uh, you know volumes of vocabulary yeah volumes of words in their repertory yeah did they not find enough words to express themselves what was the point they could not communicate well enough yes on paper they did but they, but the, their communication did not help well you could associate their um, their deaths or their attempted suicides to their own uh, you know depression or psychological state of being but still my point is that language no matter what the situation is ever adequate to communicate it cannot completely adequately fulfillingly explain reality and thus all language is under erasure under erasure it would indicate as, as was said by guy 3 in chakravarti spiva and see um, i don't know whether i mentioned this or not but of grammatology written by derrida was translated by guy 3 spiva so guy 3 spiva uh, you know in her translation of uh, grammatology she says since the word is inaccurate it is crossed out under erasure is something that crosses out because you are not satisfied with that word or if that word is not adequately communicating the intent since the word is inaccurate it is crossed out since it is necessary it remains legible so this was first asurato uh, it was first um you know the term was first coined possibly by martin heidegger i think and but heidegger puts being under erasure in order to signal his rejection of the notion that being stands apart from the realm of objects that is not in the world for derrida this critic hardly goes far enough so derrida has a completely uh, or sl- uh, slightly he has modified it or this this term to suit his idea that the in to express the inadequacy of language and hence what you do is you strike off certain words from a text to uh, uh, to you know it implies that a particular signifier is not wholly suitable for the concept it represents but must be used as a constraints of a language or for nothing better okay so what we do is you are you know that the words on the page do not really um, you know complete the meaning complete or give the uh, expected meaning but still they need to be there they need to be there and hence you let them stay despite its inadequacy so while western tradition right from plato endorses writing inferior to speech derrida demonstrates that speech itself to be a form of writing he calls it as writing on the air waves so what does derrida do he even calls speech as writing now this this writing would be a capital w okay whereas the writing that we normally write with a pen and a paper would be a small capital i mean small w would start with a small w so writing on the air waves or on the memory of the listener or recording device see it is very uh, an abstract concept but still uh, quite imaginative see he says that speech itself is like writing because what we are doing is we are using our lips our mouth to create a word to write the word on air waves so our paper is nothing but air waves when we you know use speech when we speak or on the memory of the listener or a recording device so i am writing now on a device right and i'm going to upload this writing on youtube and send it to you guys so under raja derrida comes to the point that speech may occur within writing and writing may occur within speech he even states that writing may occur either before or after speech 
At times, writing may express the passion that exists prior to speech. See, writing is wholesome, it is complete, and it may, it may not even require speech, right? Such writing may be articulated by singing, speaking. See, it's a writing with a capital W. So this kind of writing may be articulated by singing, speaking, shouting, gesturing, and by writing. So writing too is included in it. So both speech and writing and the hierarchy they hold for centuries is now under erasure. So the oh, both the idea of speech and writing that has been carried on or that have been believed by people over the centuries is now under erasure. So Derrida marks that the concepts are under erasure by drawing an X over them. So a typographical letter over them. Thus, it is the non-concept of meaning. Non-concept of meaning as in you are making meaning of a concept and this becomes a non-concept. Neither affirming nor rejecting but suspending it. Suspending logic, reason, truth to leave space for further signification. So, so there is now space for aporia. I believe we have spent lot a time long enough. I'll stop here and inshallah we'll continue tomorrow or in my next video. Thank you so much for your patient listening. Assalamu alaikum. Stay safe.